For Camp Rock 2, the final jam, we are headed back into the great outdoors for another music-filled summer vacation. And just like every summer after you graduate and enter the workforce, this one still has some fun moments, but overall it's a lot less magical than you remember. But if you like static camera angles of static tween dancers dancing ecstatically, then boy do we have the camp for you. They're gonna be looking you right in the eye while they flail around. But that's not all. From dueling camps to forbidden romance and just enough hip hop influence to feel trendy without alienating white audiences, Camp Rock 2 has it all. And we're gonna dive into it clip by clip in this installment of Clip Breakdown. So stay tuned, baby. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV, and other media and break it apart, clip by little clip. To ask ourselves, is there a reason for that? Why do we, what, what, what? And today we'll be asking that very same question about Camp Rock 2, which came out in 2010 on the Disney Channel, a full two years after 2008's Camp Rock. Surely with two years of production time in between and the rising star power of the cast, this movie was guaranteed to deliver us better dance numbers, bigger songs, and more exciting plot points than before. Well, the musical numbers are certainly bigger, like there are more kids in them, but I don't usually think of more kids as like an added benefit. If I get on a plane and there's more than one baby, I think it's my right to cause a scene. But we do get to see a more complicated side of our main character, Mitchie, and I think that's an interesting idea to explore, although I'm curious how well Camp Rock 2 actually pulls it off. Let's dive in and see how we feel but first make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns just like this on my channel there's a whole playlist I'll link below but most importantly if you're new to my channel I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here that way you never miss new videos from me I upload two new ones every week make sure you turn on your notifications and you'll always be in the know you don't want to be outside the know then you'll be from Camp Star the rival camp from across the lake which is exactly the plot point that we get in this first scene where Mitchie's driving into camp with our girl Connie Connie is her mom for those of you who didn't see my review on Camp Rock 1, I'll put that there. This is gonna be the best summer ever. Nothing can make me lose my focus. What is that? Somebody open another camp? Not sure about the camp situation, but Connie, can you maybe redirect your eyes back to the road? You're about to plow us right into some campers. On the first day of camp, Rock, I was hit by an SUV. Now, it's hard not to notice that a lot of the characters in Camp Rock feel a little bit more mature in this installment than in the previous. Although in the story, this is supposed to just be the very next summer vacation about a year later. In reality, Camp Rock 1 was shot from September to October 2007. That was shot at a YMCA camp in Ontario. Camp Rock 2 was shot all the way in like August 2009. So a full two years later, that means Allison Stoner and even Demi Lovato went from being 14 and 15 to 16 and 17, which is kind of a noticeable age difference. Just by the way that they're costumed, it feels a little more, well, I'll let you be the judge. In the car, Mitchie's basically telling her mom, she's like, oh, don't worry about it. I'm still the same young, fresh-faced girl I always was. And then the second she gets out of the car, it's like, I'm a savage. Ratchet. Yes, Mitchie, enter that bunk with your wedge heels. Show them what they've been missing all year. Although Mitchie remarks that there aren't seemingly as many people at Camp Rock as there were the summer before, she's very excited to get into the bunk and meet all of her old friends, even the ones who are her enemies still from last time. I guess no one cares about my life. You got blunt bangs and veneers. What else do we need to know? We can see it all on your face, Tess. We have this little tell me more, tell me more type of moment because Demi Lavor Lavordo, <laughs> Demi Lavordo, Demi Lavorporp, she tells her friends that although she and Shane Gray have been texting all year and emailing, she's really excited to be able to see him this summer and get to spend some time with him. But apparently back with the Connect 3 gang played by the Jonas Brothers, things aren't quite that simple. Can we please just wait for the tow truck? Oliver tried and he couldn't get it. Oliver is not properly motivated. He's not trying to get to Camp Rock before Mitchie. You should have never taken that shortcut. Why does Oliver sound exactly like Miss Vanjie from RuPaul's Drag Race? I was trying to be closer with you. Also, Disney Channel, I know you're not coming up into my house introducing characters that we never see again. Oliver is the new Sierra. I'm still mad about Sierra because she was put into the movie Camp Rock 1 and then unceremoniously killed off. Sierra should have been the bus driver for Connect 3. She could be where Oliver is and be like, thanks for giving me a job driving your bus, kids. All three of the Jonas Brothers are sporting much better 
their hairstyles here. It's like all of them learn to just embrace their natural texture a little more. Love that for them. 2007 to 2009 was such a good jump for hair. I mean, we still had a lot of progress to make, but we were getting there. Never forget. But in case you were wondering whether Kevin Jonas was still gonna be yucking it up as the comedic relief of the trio, I've got some bad news for you. The answer is yes. Oh, here you go. Is this from the tire? Yeah. I thought laying on the ground before. That was important, so I put it in my pocket. Why didn't you tell me this earlier? How could I have told you if I didn't remember until now? Also, how can you tell me if you don't open your mouth fully? Why are you guys mumbling? I feel like the Jonas Brothers thought it would be embarrassing if they acted like they were in a movie too much. So they were like, we have to act like we're Jonas Brothers in a school play the whole time. Now, I even remember from the promotional marketing for Camp Rock 2, they were showing us behind the scenes clips of this next sequence where there's actually like a big budget stunt that happens. No! I don't know why, but it made me really uncomfortable to see the underside of a bus like that. I was like, that's what it looks like? Creepy. For them playing up this scene in the pre-release clips and making it such a big feature of the beginning of the movie, you would really think that this bus turning over had something to do with the plot, but it absolutely does not. I get that they want to show Shane really wants to be at Camp Rock before Mitchie to surprise her, but that's also not important. And you'll see how they get out of this conflict in just a minute, and we'll think of maybe a different way they could have used this cool bus flip to motivate some story progression, but whatever, they just knocked it over into a ravine. And they say that bus is still somewhere in a Toronto canal. The three sets of vacant eyes staring up into the sky, sun bleached and withered. Back at the bunks, the girls are all talking to Mitchie about what they're gonna do for their final jam song this year. For whatever reason, Mitchie's in charge of everything in this movie. They're like, oh, in the last hour of the summer last year, you discovered your voice and learned how to sing. That makes you our leader from now on. It's like Margaret is the one who won the competition with her song, wouldn't you want her to be the leader of all of this? Why even make her the winner of the last movie and then just forget all of that and make Mitchie the main character? Oh, because Mitchie's the white star that Disney chose. Also, Peggy came out on stage and was like, I'm Margaret. And they were like, who? Wow, Margaret's really standing up for herself. But then in this movie, they call her Peggy again. And she's like, I'm good singing backup. Don't worry about it. This is a common thing for a lot of sequels to basically obliterate whatever character progression happened in the first movie and just retcon on all of that to make like a similar conflict happen again. Like someone finds themselves in the first movie and then they find themselves again in the second movie. It's like, maybe you still don't know who you are is the issue. I'm breaking out my six string and playing from my heart. Oh, that is amazing. I love it. So <laughs> really, thank you. That's all I got so far. Maybe we could just sing the first part over and over again. That's it. Really? Nobody ever agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this movie has so many situations where they all end giving little chuckles. Like, nobody ever ends a conversation being like... <laughs> The formula is just girl one says something and then the less smart girl says something stupid and everyone goes uh, 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 and then they walk out of the scene like that. It's basically a movie's way of giving you a laugh track when they don't use a laugh track. You know, it's like they're laughing because they want the audience to be laughing. If your comedy was good, you wouldn't have to tell me to do it. It would just be involuntary. Like when I gag every time I see Alison Stoner's hairstyles in this movie. That's my most authentic reaction to Camp Rock 2. I'm sorry to say. Is it it rude to make fun of a child's hairstyle? Yes. I'm sorry. You really couldn't tell from the sound design of that last clip, but when Mitchie was saying, that's it, it was because she was hearing some music outdoors. Baron Sanders! Hey, what's up? What's going on? Aaron Sanders, we've decided to give your characters names in this sequel. Those two kids were just backup dancers being like, a do 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 do. But then Disney is like, oh, I think we're gonna bring them back, so we should probably establish their names. Oh, Aaron and Sanders, of course. Now we have the whole Disney name cast. All of our our camp rock friends like Rakela, Ashlinka, Mennonite. It's like, don't any parents in this universe just go with Catherine? Can't we get a Sarah in the mix for some realism? Not everybody was named by Dr. Seuss. Play it again. You mention anything. Let's rock. Yeah, everybody, let's rock. Tip tap, tip tap, tip tap. Are you guys ready for our first show-stopping musical number of Camp Rock 2? The first jam of the final jam, if you will. <laughs> right off the bat, I was like, okay, we've got some interesting lip sync choices happening in the close-up. It's another summer, that's how this chapter starts. 
The song is saying starts, but her mouth is saying steers, and that's a little weird. When we get those really awesome crane shots or dynamic hammer movement during a big dance number, it makes things feel really cool and cinematic. That sort of falls off throughout the rest of the movie, but just enjoy it for this single shot. I'm sorry, what was those dance moves? Can you show me that again? Because I think I saw something a little strange. Not the Dinga Durgan duck walk and the armor arms. What in the musical theater step touch jazz square was that? They do a lot of this. As soon as I found myself waddling through a field with a bunch of teenagers, I would be like, I'm just gonna call my agent real quick and figure out what he's smoking. Also, Demi, did you think I wouldn't notice you switched from heels to flats just because you're doing the hokey pokey and turning it all about? I caught you, girl. Ella's still wearing her little wedges. What's your issue, girl? You're the main character. You're the star of the show, as you'll soon let us know. Demi Lovato's character bosses people around in this like she's the manager at TJ Maxx. It's nuts. Throughout this whole song, you get really good shots. I'm actually impressed with this whole number. Clearly, they wanted to front load some of that production schedule and budget on the first songs in the movie because we have separate dance sequences. We have cameras roaming through the forest. I even love these plastic orange leaves they put all over the floor to like make it so that it's not like a brown forest floor all the time. But there are times where everyone's just cheesing straight into the camera, like just looking straight at me. But at least they're done doing that duck walk. Oh no. Is every student at Camp Rock required to wear a G-string? Because they're all walking like they're really uncomfortable in the undergarment area. I just want my Camp Rockers to be comfortable. Everyone in the audience is like, woo, who's that girl? The other campers at Camp Rock are a complete mystery to me. I want to understand their hive mind because they basically all make decisions as one. And they seem to be this hybrid camper slash camp counselor, depending on what hat they're wearing. Because sometimes you'll see someone and it's like, you're 28, you're a camper here. Meanwhile, little Stevie is in charge of the billing department. After their big number, we get surprise guests once again. My nephews, connect three! Hey. Oh. Probably shouldn't have tied his shoes together. He's the one who said he can make anything look cool. Actually, Nate, what he said was, Everything's cool when I do it. It seems like a subtle change, but if you're not gonna use the same words, I'm not gonna realize it was a callback. So my only thought was, when did he say he can make anything look cool? Also, the whole bit about them losing their tour bus and then riding a chicken farm thing back to the camp, it really goes nowhere. As we'll see throughout the movie, Shane Gray and Mitchie actually start to drift apart a little bit because Mitchie's so focused on the camp while Shane wants to spend time with her. I feel like they could have used this bus tipping over sequence to actually feed into that plot point a little bit rather than just being a completely separate storyline about how it was a little difficult for them to get to camp. They were a little late and nothing ever mattered about it. For example, how come we couldn't have held off on Shane and Connect 3 from arriving at camp a little later? Give them like the first act of the movie to be going on this planes, trains, and automobile type thing where they're like, by any means possible, we have to get to camp. Our bus tipped over. So we hitchhiked and that person was a crazy Connect 3 fan who we had to jump out of their car and then we got picked up by this chicken bus and now we're riding with chickens and baka baka. That was my chicken sound. Meanwhile, back at the camp the whole time, Mitchie's like, I really thought Shane Gray was gonna come here this summer, but I guess maybe he's too big of a star. Give her some doubt. That way when he arrives, he can be like, no, no, I went through all of this trouble to get here for you. That would have been a better conflict, I think, that would have felt more tense. There's like some dramatic irony knowing that the boys are on the road trying everything they can to get here. Meanwhile, Mitchie is back at camp doubting their relationship. Do that instead, Camp Rock 2. And just to further sell that Mitchie is the main character of this movie, the entire world seems completely fixated on what's up with her and Shane. I guess it makes sense because Shane is a celebrity, but it seems unhealthy. They are gonna be with us for the entire summer. The official reason being they miss their uncle. But I don't think that's the entire story. Um, Shane, why is your British uncle with hair loss putting pressure on us to have premarital sex? Just wondering. We know it's gonna be hard, but just treat us like normal campers. 
I also don't know why they try to tease out this little thing of like, oh, the people at Camp Rock don't actually care about them being celebrities anymore. When in the last movie, it was like the biggest deal ever that Shane Gray was at the camp and people were chasing him around. All of these disconnections make the movie feel so much more laborious to watch. It's like, these don't feel like the, exactly the same people. It's clearly shot two years later. I also just love these dead-eyed extras who turn away from him. I like to think that these two girls were siblings and their Canadian mom was like, we're not getting portraits done at Sears this year, so you better just look right into the camera at one point today, okay, girls? I'm gonna screenshot that and send it out for Christmas. I don't know what's up with Brown and his business strategy, but apparently it includes divulging important trade secrets to the entire camp. We're a little smaller this year, and that is courtesy of our new friends across the lake camp star. Founded not so coincidentally by my out to destroy me, still mad that I kicked him out of the group, former bandmate Axel Turner. Axel Turner, the guy who owns Star Records, he's across the lake. Does anyone else holding a microphone want to offer some exposition while we're here? Thanks, Tess. First, Brown gets on the mic and he's like, my nephew has an erection for that girl. And then he's like, I've got a feud going on with another grown man and I'm going to concern you children with it. There are some kids who this is their first year at Camp Rock and they're like, I was told I would learn to play clarinet here. But you guys, maybe Camp Star across the lake is not gonna be so bad after all. I mean, look at this gesture of goodwill. It's full of marshmallows. This one has chocolate. <laughs> Ram crackers. I'm afraid we have to break down every single reaction to this gift from all of these kids because it's haywire. We are in chaos mode. Peggy, you kick us off. You're doing great, sweetie. I have no notes for you. Caitlin, you're up on stage. Who are you looking out at when you say that? You're talking to the horizon? Also, I feel like the guy next to her overreacts a little bit. She says, here's some chocolate. And he goes, whoa. If you're that surprised by some chocolate, I'm going to ask you not to go down aisle eight of any grocery store. The graham crackers kid, I would love to display him, but it seems like this whole camp is obsessed with graham crackers. As Mitchie's reading the note from Camp Star, look at Shane and these girls in the background examining those cookies. Camp Rock's invited to an opening night barn fire. Ooh, do I put this in my butt? Another thing that sequels love to do, and Camp Rock is no exception, is adding in new elements to the story and acting like they were always there. That's what we get with this group of junior rockers. Hey, what's up, guys? I remember when I used to be a junior rocker. Is that a camera book? You dropped it, Curly. You swim for it. Oh, we got some definite ADR there. We can see that kid clearly not speaking. You dropped it, Curly. You swim for it. I think it's because in the next scene, Kevin shows up completely soaking wet. And without that line, it wasn't clear that he got wet by swimming for the camera. I could see how on the page it maybe was supposed to come off obvious that he jumped in after the camera for the kid, but it probably would leave people confused in test audiences, I would imagine, because I would I almost didn't know. But yes, the junior rockers are gonna be a feature in this whole thing and they somehow are supposed to play into this narrative that Mitchie and her friends are like the senior rockers even though Mitchie's only been there for one year before this but now she's straight up you know mother hen showing the other kids how to use sanitary pads I swear we have a lot of scenes where the adults are talking in this movie so love those we have Brown meeting Axel his former bandmate oh and they start to build in the whole morality issue here that a lot of Disney movies actually do where it's like the good guys are in it for the art or the passion or the fun of it and then the evil people are in it for the monetary gain for fame for the success we got that in brink with the soul skaters versus the sponsor skaters and i feel like it happens a lot camp star is dedicated to producing the superstars of tomorrow what's your place about again Encouraging kids in their love of music, Axel. And teaching them to whittle waddle down a dirt path, okay? This next clip is basically just a montage of how much I hate fake drinking. Like, people who cannot fake drink something out of a cup, just put some water in the cup. I don't care. It'll make a difference. I promise you. Ready? What is that? Hot chocolate. They're handing it out free when you walk in. Plus, you get to keep the mug. What? Kevin Jonas, I'm gonna snatch that mug out of your hand and fill it with spider legs. I swear, it's making me mad. Ready? This is how it looks if I were to fake drink something. Like, no, that's not how you drink something. You should know you probably have to drink water to subsist. Be inspired by how you really drink water, not by how a cartoon duck would drink water. Jeez. Mm -hmm. See, real drinking has dribbles. Another favorite thing of mine that all sequels do, or many anyway, many anyway. Hi, I'm Madam Many Anyway, here to tell you all about why Camp Rock 2 is sh
Another thing that sequels love to do is define characters with a personality that they did not even begin to show in the first movie. For Ella in this one, we get that she's like a costume designer. I think it's because in the first movie, really the only characteristic she had was that she was flighty, a little ditzy, and she was like second fiddle to Tess. Now, however... Look, they actually have a real wardrobe department with incredible fabric. They thought we need each kid to have something really distinctive. So we're going to go ahead and give this girl costuming and act like that's always been her deal. While the camp rockers are at Camp Star at this kind of fireside jam that we have is another area just like in the first movie where I noticed a deleted scene that wasn't on the Disney Plus version but was on this YouTube version. In Disney Plus they all sit down and Axel is like does anyone want to sing and nobody says anything so he's like okay our group will start and when I saw it I was like oh that's a little weird that Mitchie wouldn't stand up and be like I'll sing something as soon as she gets the opportunity. So imagine my surprise when I I was watching the YouTube version of the movie for this clip breakdown, and this happens. Does anyone have anything they'd like to play? Camp Rockers, don't be shy. We'll go if nobody else wants to. And then, you guys, it goes into a full song that we didn't get on the Disney Plus version. You're right, we don't need another song in this movie. That was my thought as well. Will we remember Guys, I don't know what's up with Mitchie, but she seems a little obsessed with summer. This movie came out in September, so they were marketing Camp Rock 2 all summer vacation long, being like, this is our summer, because that's the name of one of the songs. We'll get to that title song later, but first, after Mitchie does her super tedious acoustic song, oh my god, it was so boring. I was like, okay, Lisa Loeb, go home. I like Lisa Loeb, by the way, but not right now. Especially not compared to this number we get from the Camp Starsers. <laughs> There is nothing so intimidating as a group of dancers who look exactly like Danny Zuko from Grease. Someone said, do you think that the cuffed blue jeans look a little too 1950s? Mm, maybe. Let's add a crystal wallet chain to really balance things out and bring it into the now. Toronto's best costuming department, ladies and gentlemen. In this next clip, we see an alum of the Clip Breakdown series. We see Chloe Bridges, who we last saw in Airplane Mode, starring Logan Paul. She's younger, obviously, in this movie because it was shot full seven years earlier than airplane mode. She looks still really mature and gorgeous. And in fact, she was cast in this movie, Camp Rock 2, after being passed over for the role of Mitchie in Camp Rock 1. So it's great to see her back on the list, making this physically impossible arm fling happen. As you can see, Chloe's bracelet flies off of her arm, and although it seems to only be in the air for two seconds, it magically transports from the back of the stage to the front row of the audience, which seems to be about, um, I don't know, 12 yards? I'm not exactly sure that this movie really cared about setting up the spatial reasoning of the camp. I always feel like that's a little distracting and confusing when you don't subconsciously know where everybody is in relation to each other and to the camera, because then it's sort of just like, oh, it's whatever they want. It's low budget, they just shoot what they can wherever they can and cut it all together. But you guys, this is where some shady stuff starts happening, okay? If there are any Camp Rock counselors or staff who'd like to make the switch, I'd be more than willing to double your salary. I'll go. Tell your parents to sign you up for Camp Star, where we hire your caretakers before even meeting them. I don't know what a kind of money these camps are pulling in every summer, but for him to be able to double all of these counselors' salaries, I mean, double them, really? I think Axel is just sinking his money into this thing and it's not really profitable. So how long is Camp Star really gonna be around? Nate, who is played by Nick Jonas, returns Dana's bracelet to her. The writers of Camp Rock and Camp Rock 2 were like, we need something big and important to happen. Is there any way we can get there by using a charm bracelet because this is the second time they've used a bracelet to make something kind of conveniently work out for them. Someone in the writer's room said, we need to come up with a creative idea here. And someone else said, really guys? <laughs> I think we're good. Meanwhile, Demi Lovato, I mean Mitchie, is just wandering around this camp like she owns the place. Now this is a recording studio. Hey. Um... Hi, can I help you with something? Uh, well, this is my camp, so maybe I can help you out the door, you dummy. Don't talk to me like that. You came on a boat over to my place. You step into my recording studio with your soaked through canoe shoes. Let's not get into a fight here in my camp yard. Do I know you? Luke Williams? I was just on stage like, like two minutes ago. I'm giving you the fire. Oh, do, 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 no. 
Oh, they teach yodeling here at Camp Star too. He said, I'm giving you the fire yodeling. Mitchy, I don't know if anyone's ever told you to stop rolling your eyes, but you're about to get smacked. I also love in this movie how Demi Lovato has been at this camp for one summer and she's met maybe a third of the people in it, but she's willing to go all in being very confident in everybody's character. Not one camp rocker, not in a million years, would ever even think about coming over to this narcissistic, overproduced ego factory. Guess what? My mom said yes. I get to make the switch. Mitchie said, a camp rocker would never debase themselves by coming over to this side of the lake. Real confident about these people you met two minutes ago. Meanwhile, Tess is like, hey, camp star. Later on, team Snaggletooth. Tess, how could you? Oh, I'm so sorry. I feel horrible, but... <laughs> <laughs> Who am I kidding? I am so excited. I can't even pretend to be sympathetic. You can't really pretend to be laughing either. It comes off as very uncomfortable. Of course, Tess knows all about making people uncomfortable. That was great what you did up there. I'm giving you the fire. So impressive. He's like, uh -huh. I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt and assume it's just really late and you're tired. But welcome to Camp Star. The next morning, Brown tells everybody that although it's a good thing that they didn't lose too many campers to the feuding camp, they did lose all of their staff and therefore Camp Rock had to close. And there's nothing he can do about it. But Mitchie is not taking it that easy. This is our summer and we're not giving up. We're not backing down. I don't know, Mitchie. We can't, we can't back down. What in the Avengers Age of Ultron? Why are you gearing up like you're Iron Man? We can't, we can't back down. We can't, we can't back down. We can't, we can't back down. As you can see, Demi is really starting to get the crowd going and thinking maybe we can fix this. But all I can focus on is the fact that it's supposed to sound like all of these people joining in to sing. And it's literally just Demi Lovato's voice doubled over and over again, which I think is one of the reasons why it doesn't sound too impressive. Like if you listen to a musical cast recording where they're actually recording a full choir, it sounds really big because you get all of those varied voices and harmonies and like vocal arrangements. But for Camp Rock 2, they're like, what if we just have a lot of tinker, tinker, tink sounds in the background? We, tink -a -tink -a -tink -a -tink -a we get this moment in a lot of musicals where it's like the turning of the tides, everyone feels downtrodden and it's up to the main character to make everyone see the light. That guy was like, um, I was on my way to go give myself an insulin shot, but okay, I guess I'll just die at this table. I'm pretty sure in this scene, every actor got the memo that they needed to wear something plaid. Cause at this point, I'm just seeing four people wearing plaid, filling up the whole screen, along with every plastic accessory your mom could ever get you with her extra Kohl's cash. Now this number was actually the last one that they shot for the whole movie. And I love it because the choreography involves lots of fluid arm movements like I love. I love this one. In our own backyard. See how good that is? I love anything that lets me do this. Ooh hoo hoo. I'm Mr. Noodle Arms. I think I've already mentioned how tedious these songs can be, and I don't think you get it. With every big decision comes an equally important share of the risk. Why is Demi just quoting the addendum from her Disney contract now? She's like, if a nude picture leaks, then I forfeit all my royalties. They all can't back down. It's very important that their arms jut out in all directions. I swear, the amount of acrylic nails I would get in my eyeballs if I was at this camp, because every minute it's like, ooh, okay, geez, Demi, thank you. But I have a feeling this plan really is gonna work out. Let's see. What's going on? Well, you said you needed some new counselors, so I found you some. And it looks like I should call this staff meeting to order. No background checks, no CPR training, no tax information, but you do have the right hats on and that's all we need, baby. Let's get out there and kill some kids. Oof, she's thirsty today. Right off the bat, we get a montage of how crazy and chaotic Camp Rock is under their care. It's hard for the counselors to get to the right places. All right, let's dance. Sorry. You'll notice that Caitlyn is magically no longer the world's next top music producer like she was in Camp Rock 1. Now she's fittingly a dance instructor. They were like, so Allison, it turns out it was really obvious that you were the only one with dance experience in the last movie. Shoulda known. So we're gonna really lean into that for this one and pay you for what you do best. Sorry about that. Also, this is my fourth time watching this movie this week and I'm just now noticing that this shot with Nick Jonas is a reference to the Bruce Springsteen cover. Sorry it took me so long to notice that. I just was born after 9 
1975. This is one of several instances in Camp Rock 2 where I'm like, whose dad got their hand on this script? They're putting a lot of Mick Jagger references in. I think they're trying to establish Camp Rock as like the old school rock and roll camp where Camp Star is like new school, hit factory, trendy people. But I'm just sitting here like, I would like for any of these camps to be good at any type of music. You don't seem to have a grasp on music at all. Here's some Kevin teaching the children all about music. Who wants to be a lead singer? Well, you are gonna have to buy tighter pants and learn how to play a tambourine. I heard that. Sorry! It's true. Don't talk to children about the tightness of their pants, ever. That's my first rule as a camp counselor, I would say. Also, some more bad spatial explanation here, right? Like, in what world did Joe hear that sentence enough to be like, I heard that, and where is the cabin in relation to Joe here? Is it the one to the left? Because if Joe was actually there on set when Kevin was talking, couldn't they have put him behind the door there? Like, he's walking by the window and he's like, hey, I heard that, sorry, and then he keeps it moving. The fact that they had to do a cutaway tells me that this was really cheated in a way that wasn't planned properly for me. You have a small budget, but it doesn't take money to plan things like that so that you can, you know, frame your shots so that they are funny. Let your shots tell the joke with you. You don't want your joke to be working against the way that the video's edited. Yesterday, I ordered 50 pounds of black beans and they delivered 50 cases of beach balls. Never missing a chance to squeeze in those token non-white kids, huh? Also, what kind of place sells both black beans and beach balls? Nate is having his whole forbidden romance sort of plot line with Chloe Bridges or Dana. This whole storyline, I can't stand it. I'm like, come on, we know where this is going. We know what's gonna happen at the end. The stakes never seem fully high enough. It's a lot. Hey, man. Oh, what are you doing? Why does everybody keep doing that? Sorry. We're just doing our part as activity directors. What's the activity today? Wakeboarding. <laughs> Wow, this kid is just everywhere around the camp, huh? Does he have a teleportation device that gets him from one dumb scene to another? I'm stumped. Also, the guy who's driving the jet ski is like, I was paid to drive this jet ski, not to turn my head or act like I'm in a movie at all. I'm just here to do one thing and one thing only. Back on dry land, Nate and Dana are having their first real conversation, but Nate's having a hard time expressing himself. Do you wanna say something really stupid? I was goofing around and I accidentally sort of wrote your name on my hand, but used permanent ink by mistake. No one's ever written my name on their hand before. Mainly because why would they after elementary school? And also, why are you doing this now? And also, are you 12? I have no idea what this writing your name on my hand thing is. Like, come on, girl. This boy just swam out of a lake to see you. I don't think you need to show him that. Keep that hidden under your sleeve. It's a little desperate. Axel, the dad, keeps breaking up their romance, though, and interrupting them. And every time Nick is like, oh, I'm such an idiot. I can't talk to her like I want to. And it's not only like he gets tongue-tied when he's around her. Her, it, that's what I think they want to show us, but it really seems like he just doesn't like her. She'll be like, oh, I drew this on my hand for you, and he's like, wow, really cool of you. Shane is starting to get a little fed up because he's not getting to spend the time with Mitchie that he wants to, but she's just really busy trying to single-handedly keep this whole camp running, even though there's a full-grown adult who should be helping her. It seems, however, that the real adults in the situation couldn't care less if these kids are roasting themselves on an open fire. Come back here! Oh. Wow, okay, catch him, everybody. Let's jump, jump. Yes, everybody, look up to the sky and jump with your hands in the air right around this huge bonfire. Can't wait to see which one of you gets third degree burns on your face. Camp Rock 2 fully thinks it's a counselor's job to show kids how to watercolor and play guitar and has nothing to do with making sure they don't drown in a lake. I remember doing that. It was fun. Don't even think about it. Tess, I don't know what your deal is. You seem to just want to be wherever the action is, don't you? You wanted to switch over to Camp Star because they put on a magical show. Now you want to switch back to Camp Rock because they're catching fireflies. Why don't you just go home? Go home and try another hairstyle. But as we know, the Camp Rockers are not going to back down. And just because Camp Star has the bigger ego doesn't mean they have the gumption to stomp through the dirt like a bunch of animals. I haven't seen such a powerful stampede of purple sweatpants and sundresses since the One Direction movie opened. This intimidating presence can only mean one thing. Camp Rock is ready to challenge the people of Camp Star. And they've got the competitive hand motions to prove it. Check out the guy in the background. Camp Rock versus Camp Star, the final jam. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, come and get some, kids. Yeah, can we ask the tall gentleman in the back to cool it? Thanks. This leads us into the competitive back and forth song called It's On, which is I think the song where Tess realizes the frightening power of her sharp elbows. 
She gives you the full big bird, jutting those arms forward. Even Caitlin jumps back. She's like, ooh, we got sharp points at the end of those bones, bony baby. There's even a part where all the boys break off and do their own separate type of hip hoppy dance. I think it's really damaging that you're making all the girls say something without their consent. That's manipulative. Also, can you just imagine how hot it is dancing around under all those layers of hooded sweatshirts? You could probably melt a quesadilla in one of their armpits. This song, again, so long. I feel like they made a song that was four minutes too long, and then when they came time to shoot it, they're like, crap, all we can do is have these kids stand in a bunch of groups around and dance, dance, dance. Because the camera just keeps going from one group of kids dancing to another group of kids dancing. Meanwhile, these poor child actors are like, shake it, shake it, shake it. They're not even sure what they're saying at this point. They're just running on pure Welch's fruit snacks from the craft services table. Of course, Axel's in the mix and he's gonna step things up even more. What if we put this little competition on TV? Have the public decide who's really the best. TV? Uh I don't really know about this. But that would be so cool. The whole world would see us. Come on, Mitchie. This could be huge. You're on. Oh, Mitchie's in charge of everyone now, just so we all know. Why? Because she's the whitest girl with the loudest voice. That's all we need. Of course, Mitchie's very comfortable stepping into this lead role. Suddenly, she's got a magical songbook with something pre-written for every occasion. I wrote this song a long time ago, and I kind of forgot about it, but I think it could work. I lay pretty, pretty flowers on your grave. You're on the wrong page. Yeah, that song was for my hamster's funeral. <laughs> this movie's almost two hours, and we really have time for this? Really? <laughs> Also, I feel like Mitchie just handed them a page with some lyrics written on it, and suddenly they all know everything they need to about this song. The stadium could be pretty cool. Yeah, it looks like there's some great spots for dancing. And it's got a great groove. Oh yeah, and the half notes seem really uh, happy. Of course, we've got to get our approval from just one more person. I think somebody should talk to Uncle Brown. Why? I already know what he's gonna say. How could she do that? Axel Turner cannot be trusted. Uh-oh, Brown has a big problem with us doing this competition with Axel, and now, unfortunately, it's too late to back out. Camp Wars, only one will survive. Millions of viewers will be watching. That's good, right? After this, we are done, and not just for the summer for good. I almost don't even want to touch the fact that Axel somehow planned this nationally televised Camp Wars TV show literally instantly. Like he told Mitchie about it yesterday and now he's got a full domain name set up with the flash site. What network is even going to carry a live Camp Wars show on such short notice? I guess I do want to talk about this. Like I'm pretty sure you need to get a live televised event on the calendar ahead of schedule like by a year to get advertisers to support it. So aside from all of that being completely unrealistic, it also doesn't makes sense why Brown is so upset about this. Connie is right. You're going to have millions of people watching this show. But he just keeps being like, he's out to destroy me. Can't you see? Give him a chance. We are going to look like a joke next to Camp Star. We don't have the resources, the infrastructure, the money, talent, passion, commitment. Yeah, we've got that. It's not gonna matter. You guys really don't see that whole ass ninth grader standing right outside the door? Anyway, what kind of infrastructure do you need to show up at this pre-planned event? They have the stage, they have the cameras, you just gotta show up and put on a good show. I think I saw last year, the final jam, you had a rather advanced production going on with lighting cues and sound system, and that was just for nobody. That was just for the kids' dirtbag parents. You're telling me you can't set up something similar just to be on TV? And Connie's right, even if they won, it's still like you're one of the two camps being shown on TV. That's like a lot of exposure. Camp Star's not gonna have room for everyone in the world to join, so both camps are gonna get a lot of new signups from being on TV. For me, this whole conflict feels really forced. He's basically being like, if we lose this camp show, Camp Rock is closed forever. And that's supposed to give Mitchie this motivation to be like really hard on everybody for the rest of the movie. I would love if there were like more stakes built into this. So if like instead, when we arrived at Camp Rock at the beginning of the movie, there's like some reality TV crew going around that's kind of a trope people do in movies too. They could be like, oh, Camp Wars is here filming and we're gonna be battling Camp Star at the end. But maybe because Camp Star opened, Camp Rock doesn't have enough signups and they do need more money so that they can expand and get the equipment they need to compete with a group like Camp Star. And there's like this big $1 million cash prize for whoever wins. But if Camp Rock doesn't win, then they're gonna be so outdated that they have to close down. That's like a more concrete way of being like, oh, they need the money, this show will get them the money. That's like something they can go after and I as a audience member know is their goal. It's like a clear objective. 
got it. But what they have here, the dilemma is basically like we show up to this thing and for whatever reason, it's not really clear how, but I won't be able to open up next summer. Okay, it's a little less exciting. Like I want a better reason. <sighs> well, we've been shooting for about two hours and we're halfway through the movie. So I had to take a little bit of a break to have a mental breakdown and eat my hair. But now we're back in action to get right back into it with our friends, Ella, Bella, Shella, Mella, and Shella. This is gonna be a long video. So it's a great chance for me to remind you to please give this video a big thumbs up if you're enjoying what you're seeing and consider subscribing to my channel if you wanna see more clip breakdowns like this. I upload two every week. I feel like the light's getting a little weird, but that's okay. Mitchie has a rallying cry for the whole team because she's basically the only one who understands how in peril the camp is. If we wanna save this camp, we have to put all of our energies into this. All of our energies into this? Maybe if you spent the school year reading a little more and not daydreaming about summer camp, you would be able to speak in front of a crowd a little better. I also think it would be more fun if Mitchie really was truly the only one who knew how important it was to win this thing because nobody else understood how out of money the camp was. Like if by overhearing Brown talking to Connie, he was like, I don't want the kids to know that if we don't win this money, we'll actually be then Mitchie doesn't want to tell anybody for whatever reason or she can't let on that she knows. So she has to be all gung-ho about this and everyone's like, why is she taking this so seriously? We hate her. And Shane is really more confused about it because as it is, Shane is like mad throughout this whole thing. Mitchie, can I talk to you? Do you know who's doing the vocal arrangements? <sighs> I'm sorry. Oh, there goes Shane Gray looking pissed with a clipboard again, just like always. That's really getting kind of old, Shane. Always looking like you didn't get hired at Hot Topic. Also, Shane, why don't you want to save your uncle's camp? That's what I really don't get. And it would be better if Shane didn't realize that the camp was at risk. Then he could be more focused on Mitchie and being like, why don't you want to spend time with me? And Mitchie could be like, I wish I could tell you why, but I can't. We just have to work. Instead, it feels very much like Mitchie's the only one who cares about saving Camp Rock. And Shane is like, but I want to get my... It all really starts to come to a head when Mitchie's getting fed up, rightfully so. Are you guys done already? <laughs> no, he was just telling me the story about his sister. You have to tell her. Oh, oh, is it the one about the group of kids that didn't take their job seriously and then the camp shut down? Mitchie, this is exactly the kind of behavior that makes you a camp friend and not a school year friend, okay? I wanted to go to Camp Star, I would have signed up. Okay, that's not fair. I'm just trying to get stuff done, but if you guys don't care, Mitchie, we all care. You gotta lighten up. Caitlin, don't tell me what to do with your banana curls coming up here looking like you're in Little House on the Prairie. In Camp Rock 1, Caitlin's trademark look was green eyeshadow and smears of purple over her eyelids. This movie, it's all about having curls that haven't been shaken out thoroughly. That girl is taking the F-U-N out of summer. There is no F-U-N in summer. Exactly. I love her, but I'm gonna kill her. Okay, Mr. Director, once I say my line, you want us to just walk out of the scene? Yes, but can you all make sure to sigh for us on the way out just a little bit? Sure. <sighs> Girls, just walk out of a scene. There's no additional noise needed. If this ground convinces Shane to launch a water balloon fight attack on everybody to help lighten up the camp, and it really does that. Everyone seems to have a great time, except for Mitchie, who just storms off. Again, this seems like another big budget scene because it takes a lot of money and a lot of time to set up a water fight like this on camera. Just like with a food fight, which we've discussed before, you're gonna need tarps over all of the cameras. You're not gonna really be able to shoot anything else for the rest of the day, like this is a hundred extras and they're all gonna be soaking wet. What I'm saying is this was probably a hard scene to shoot, but again, it has nothing to do with the plot. Like it literally could have been cut and it wouldn't have mattered. There are ways they could have made this water fight seem integral to the movie. Like what if Mitchie was setting up this really complicated mural painting the set or whatever, and then this water balloon fight happened and it knocked over something or something got ruined. And that would give Mitchie a reason to storm off. Because the way they have it, it literally just seems like these people are having normal amounts of fun and Mitchie can't deal with that. So it's hard for me as a audience member to know, am I supposed to be on Mitchie's side or the camper's side? Because I kind of hate Mitchie right now, but I also am like, these people should be helping a little more too, if they're not at all. You know, I'm confused. While Shane is trying to figure out where Mitchie is, we get a couple different lines about the fire that I think they didn't want us to hear, but because of subtitles, I got them. A lot of fire there. So fun today. Has anybody seen Mitchie? I don't know, she missed dinner. Okay, thanks. Look at the fire. <laughs> there. That's a lot of fire there. Look at the fire there. I'll take things people never say around a fire for 300, Alex. Shane is really trying to break Mitchie out of this rut, but no luck. Because you and I are going on a moonlight picnic. 
how could you... Because I'm that nice of a guy. I think that I would just go running off. And the water balloon fight, I mean, what were you thinking? Wow, wouldn't it be nice to have a little fun? So you're saying I'm not fun? Nobody with their eyebrows in this current position of yours is ever going to be seen as fun, okay? Let's work on our face not being that way, and then you can show me where some fun is. This is where Shane and Demi have their first fight, and I'm actually, once again, on Demi's side here. She's making some good points about herself. The whole reason I came was because I was... I know, was to get to know me better. Well, guess what? This is me trying to save something that I care about. So am I. Really? And how's that working out for you? That's so great. Shane, forgot your flashlight. Burn with the flashlight. I feel like they're trying to sell that Demi is taking this too seriously and she's not seeing what's most important. But my interpretation is that she cares about this camp a lot. She didn't come here solely to be in a romantic relationship with Shane. And he doesn't seem to be as interested in doing this important thing for his family. I just don't know who I'm supposed to side with in all of this. It's a little troubling. This whole song, they're like mad at each other and singing from across the camp at each other. But the lyrics are about them loving each other and not wanting to change a thing. So so I feel like the song is saying, she's so crazy, but I love her. But then when you watch the actual clip, Shane has this pissed off scowl the whole time, and I'm like, he seems like he might want to change a thing or two. The next morning, Demi wakes up and things seem just a little different around the camp. Where is everybody? Demi said, where is everybody? Hmm, better go check it out. Off we go. The adding of that cardigan was just a genius move. Now I know more about who Mitchie is as a person. Mitchie discovers that the whole camp has really rallied together to be like, you're right, we do need to help more. And Connect 3 has really stepped it up too. Shane himself. Good job. Clearly, we're more concerned with making sure every child actor has a hat on and not about making it look realistic when they're playing these instruments. The Jonas Brothers give us this song that's completely forgettable. They're like, if you want to be rocking like Bruce the Boss and something about Mick Jagger sauce. Like, it's so bad. It's like, why are you just naming all my dad's favorite musical acts? I'm a millennial, okay? I didn't follow the Grateful Dead on tour. Nick and Dana still can't seem to hit it off, mainly because Nick, I guess, can't seem to find anything personal about himself to tell her and that's I guess a big deal for Dana. I guess I just thought you were different. I am different. No you're not. You're exactly like every other teenage boy in the world. And what makes you so unique Dana that you have full lips and you play the keyboard? Please I can find that from any other cast member of Degrassi. Because he's shown this bit of interest in Mitchie, Mitchie arranges a secret meeting with Shane where they have this montage type song of them bonding over you know just camp activities. This whole scene feels really cheap to me. It's like they didn't want to show us actually a song where they're lip syncing and singing this in a romantic setting so it's just a montage of them doing some general things. They're canoeing in a boat, leaning on a railing, sitting on a picnic blanket, walking down the beach with their shoes off. I'm half expecting it to end with, and if you need help affording your medication, AstraZeneca can help. Nate sneaks back to Camp Star to share this song he wrote with Dana that lets him finally express his feelings. And this definitely gives us some of the most interesting lyrics of the Camp Rock franchise. I eat the cheese only on pizza, sometimes on a homemade quesadilla, otherwise it smells like feet to me. Dana's like, oh, actually, the more you talk, the more I realize you might have had a head injury as a child. And I like to use the word dude as a noun or an adverb or an adjective. Dude as a noun, I get. Dude as an adverb, how do you do something dudely? Oh, man, that happened so dudely. Even an adjective, man, that was so dude. Meanwhile, Dana's like, I think I'm actually going to wait another year to lose my virginity. I just decided. Also, the way that the song keeps speeding up and is supposed to be quirky and fun, I just can tell that they're basically copying Jason and there ain't no other reason to rid yourself of vanity and just go with the season that's i'm yours by jason mraz however at least this song i think is the first one again in the whole camp rock franchise to actually move the plot forward i took a class on the american musical and basically it was like this turning point where musical plays went from being a story that had songs inserted in the middle to a story where the songs actually move the plot forward which is something we see in a lot of modern musicals today. They really only accomplish it in this song because every other song you can basically skip, but this one it actually, they end up in a different place afterwards. Something is revealed throughout it. Dana, everyone's waiting. 
Sorry, it's my fault. It just doesn't work for me, this whole forbidden love thing, because honestly, the stakes never seem high there. The dad is like, Dana, I don't want you talking to that boy. And she's basically like, Psh, that's okay, dad, don't worry about it. It's never clear what's gonna happen. Like, if you talk to that boy again, you'll never come back to this camp. Or if you talk to that boy again, I'm gonna cut your tongue out and you'll never sing again. Like, go full Poseidon on her ass, I don't care. Kevin is still babysitting all the junior rockers. Their fake laughing gives me nightmares. What was that? <laughs> you gotta direct kids better than just telling them to fake laugh because all of them are gonna immediately give you that dead-eyed finger pointing and they're like, ah, 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 Never once did you laugh like that. It's decided that Demi and Shane have to take the lead for their camp rock song because the song that Demi found just requires a duet. They're gonna have to put themselves first. And there might not even be place for the junior rockers. But then Demi talks to those junior rockers for the first time in this whole movie and gets inspired by a new idea. You guys had a good summer? Only the best summer ever. <laughs> you guys just gave me the best idea ever. <laughs> Thank you. I love this idea that only the junior rockers hate Demi Lovato's character. Like everyone else at the camp is like, Mitchie, you're our best singer. But then in the kids cabin, they're like, why does she dye her hair black with absolutely no dimension? Can we talk highlights or lowlights? Finally, it's time for Camp Wars. And we've got our cool host. I really like this actress who's leading the Camp War thing. Meanwhile, Axel keeps having these hushed discussions with Brown. This man talks like he's a cartoon villainous lion the whole time. They never know. Next year, I might hire you to run my summer camp. Thanks, but well, I'm already booked. If you both are famous rock stars, neither of you should want anything to do with any summer camp at all. That's not a side venture that's popular in the music industry. Like, how much money could that feasibly make? Now, first up is Camp Star. I know if I was going to study music, this is the place I'd want to be. Why is she saying that? Uh, I don't know, Caitlin. Why are your curls from My Fair Lady? Camp Star comes out with their song. I think it's called Tear It Down. And I just want to focus on Tess's really amazing armography in this whole thing. She gives us those really great arm movements anyway, but they really get to be featured here in this number. Sing, dance, and rap. Get that. You can't hold a candle to a flesh. Tear it up and we take a name. Of course we tear it up. <laughs> This camp cost $5,000 and I learned how to do the chicken dance. If you guys weren't done with Ella being the ditzy one, then let me just give you some more of that. What happened to you? When I get nervous, I sparkle things. Oh, sweetie, I'm gonna drown you in a lake. That's her. I feel like they needed to push the makeup harder if they wanted this to be a joke. Like, she only had some glittery eyeliner on and she had to blink a thousand times a minute to make it read on camera. They were like, okay, just make sure you give us a lot of blinks so we can see that you're sparkling. Come on. I wanna see glitter. I wanna see glitter. I wanna see glitter on the lips. Like, make it a makeup gag if you're gonna make it a makeup gag. The host of Camp Wars lets us know that we're up against some tough odds because Axel has actually paid to market his team. Do you know how much money he spent marketing this? He's paying to text and tweet every cell phone user in the Western Hemisphere. How come I just got a text telling me to vote for Camp Star? Um, it's asking me if I want to download Camp Star's song as my ringtone. And I just got a text saying I did test positive for super herpes. It's a different unrelated thing, but I just wanted to share with the group. Thanks for listening, guys. Also, Caitlin's really playing for the back row there, isn't she? They're asking me if I want to buy their ringtone. Okay, well, who's out there that you're talking to? Because I'm trying to keep this conversation private. Again, we really get some more of this forbidden romance with Nate and Dana, but again, the dad is just not threatening enough here. Don't you have somewhere to be. Wish us luck. Good luck. Dana, he is the enemy. No, he's not. Not everything in life is a competition. Dana's like, oh, daddy, I don't care what you say because I know you killed mother. When it's time for Camp Rock to sing, it really feels kind of like a concert movie, the way they shoot it, like with multi-camera angles. I think it's because they shot this scene by bringing in 1,500 Camp Rock fans to be the extras. So they really did kind of have to shoot it like a concert performance. Also, you can tell that it's really cold because they have so much fog coming out of their mouths. This was probably October, so it's like getting close to winter. When you can't forget, you're gonna know. No, not the bunny hopping on stage. They're just determined to make these kids look like wet noodles every chance they get. Even the scene where they have the junior rockers dancing, like, guys, I'm a sucker for a kid who knows how to dance. That's why I'm obsessed with Allison Stoner. But they shoot these kids' dance solos like they don't even want me to see how cool their moves are.
Okay, I guess there's a chance those moves weren't that cool. So that's probably got something to do with it. However, I still think they could accentuate even mediocre dance moves with some lighting. Like if you got these two kids doing similar synchronized movements, but you throw a big spot behind them so they're silhouetted, we've got haze, they're gonna look cool, okay? But that takes time and budget. They're like, just stand in the middle of this circle with some kid holding a guitar that's too big for him and do this. Wow! Look, mom, this costs you money. Wow! In case you were wondering what Demi's big idea was, it was to include some of that video yearbook footage throughout the whole thing. We came here! So they basically made the whole song about Kevin babysitting for the whole movie. I don't, okay. The amount of plaid in these campers, they really could not stop with the plaid. But it's time for the big announcement. Who won the camp wars? And this is supposed to be like a subversion of what you would expect. Because we find the results in complete silence with just background music and everything's in slow motion. But you can tell from the slowly melting looks of sadness on Camp Rock's face, they did not win against the flashier team. And to me, it's really no surprise. Like, sorry, but Camp Rock rock song was never gonna win. It wasn't that entertaining. Camp Rock was going for this whole acoustic pure sound this whole like time. It just was boring. It was boring. I wanted to skip the whole song. And for some reason, they do everyone dirty with this slow motion scene. Demi was like, I'm gonna really ugly cry for this scene. And they were like, great, we're gonna hold on that for a while. So hope you're okay with that. Like, what kind of way is that for the scene to end? They show Tess put her hand on her shoulder as though to comfort her. And it's like, I don't think Tess leaving the camp was really the biggest conflict of this whole thing. It just kind of served to show how bad Camp Star was. So I don't know why they had to end with that sort of forgiveness. And then just Demi Lovato being like, mm not great. And later on, Demi and Shane are folding up the flag like it's the legit American flag. It's like, that's your Camp Rock flag. Once Mitchie learns to make some friends at school, she's gonna forget all about these kids. That's what I'm guessing. But it's time for one last song, which seems to be purely about singing a song around the fire during the summer. This is our song. That's all that matters. There's nothing better than singing along. This is our summer. They're like singing songs of songy and singing around the fire and sitting and singing songs about fire summer. Okay, it really feels like the writers are like, oh my God, this script is too long. We just got to end it, but they're at a fire now. We got to have them sing around the fire now. But Camp Star hears the singing and they actually start to join because they're like, this is so much more fun than our camp. Ron, if it's okay with you, I'd really like to come back to Camp Rock next summer. God, Tess, when do you graduate high school? I don't want you coming back to this camp anymore. You're so flip flopping. Can I get a little help inside? The phone's are going crazy. Yeah, sure I'll help. Oh, so it seems like Connie was right the whole time. The exposure did help Camp Rock, just like we thought. So there was never any conflict in the first place. They lost Camp Wars and they still don't have to close down. So they were never in any risk. They just had to do their thing. Just in case you're wondering why this movie feels like nothing happened, it's because nothing happened. I told my parents I want to come here instead next summer. Please, can you put us on the list? Sure, do any of the other Demi Lovato stand-ins have a line they want to give us before we close out? And that's all we wrote for Camp Rock 2, the final jam, bringing us to the end of the Camp Rock franchise. What do you guys think of this movie? Did you find it as bad as I did? I think the first movie is like a high favorite for me. The second one is much lower. But let me know your feelings below and let me know what movies I should check out next. But make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns just like this and make sure you click that subscribe button if you want to be updated every time I upload. Two new videos every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be in the freshest knowing of it all. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for singing all summer songs, singing, sing, song, song with me. I will see you next time.